So welcome to the Mobile Internet Aficionados July 2015 chat. Today we're actually going to be uh, tackling a topic on installing antennas on your RV roof. Uh, normally we do just a general question and answer and take your questions. Today we're actually going to give you some information as we have this rare opportunity um, to be in the same room with Peter and John of the RV Geeks. Uh, put your hands up so they might be able to recognize you. <laughs> your hands. Well, my hands are maybe more recognizable and maybe my voice. I'm Peter. Nice to be here. And I'm John. Nice to and, be here as well. And for those who don't get the jokes, RV Geeks are famous. They're the actual top YouTube channel for RV how-to and uh, do-it-yourself stuff. But uh, until now, nobody's ever seen their faces, just these famous hands. That's right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so all of their videos typically show them doing the installation, doing the maintenance on their RV. It's an excellent YouTube channel. I really highly recommend you subscribe to it if you're into YouTube, because they do some fantastic stuff. Thank you. And Thank uh, you. Thank they you. agreed on our little mini vacation here in Vancouver together. We're in an apartment that we've rented in downtown Vancouver. We've just been having a joy hanging Great out time. with you guys the last few days. Same, out. same here, and we yes. were eager to show the view behind us, but the lighting somehow didn't work so well, so unfortunately you're getting Venetian the, blinds. Yeah, the fuse software does not adjust the exposure, but the live stream, we're going to be doing a live stream later. Yes, that we'll, we'll have a... All right. So, um, also we have Stephen in the background. He'll be fielding your questions. If you have questions for us, just put them in the group chat window. We do ask that you keep them focused on, hopefully, internet. Uh, antennas first, and then we will open it up to general mobile internet questions. We are here for you MIA members, so all any questions you got, we, we got a great panel of four people. Yes, and we have a lot of experience between us. Um, if you're not familiar with them, they have, it's 12 years you guys have been full time. Just right? over 12 years on the road full time. Okay. So you have a lot of expertise <laughs> here, a lot of on the road experience. Um, they also have a lot of experience navigating mobile internet in Canada, if you want to ask them that. Poorly. <laughs> 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 or, <laughs> or maybe, we can I was going to say, after, after, we, we, defer, after we <laughs> attempted to connect last night and didn't do so well, we're not going to talk about that problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> right, so we're gonna, uh, we have some information prepared for you. I'm actually going to be asking them questions um, through an outline, and then we will turn it over to question and answers. Great. All right. Okay. So when you're doing an antenna on a roof, the first thing you really have to take in mind is what type of RV mm -hmm. that you're installing that antenna on. Uh, it's going to be different from a Class A versus a travel trailer versus a van. Uh, what are some of your general thoughts on the different RV types and some of the considerations you might want to make? Uh, one obvious thing that comes to mind is length of the RV because you're talking about needing to run a cable from an antenna on the roof in most cases to some sort of device or access area inside the RV. So if you're dealing in our case with a Class A 43 foot long motorhome on the long end of things, you may have a place where it's easier to access coming through, say, your refrigerator vent, for example, and your computer cabinet is all the way at the other end of the RV, so distance is certainly a first big consideration. How far a reach have you got to go? Mm -hmm. okay. the also, the, the construction type of yeah, the exactly. RV, if it's fiberglass versus rubber versus aluminum, no. yeah, like yeah, our yeah. bus. Right, right, exactly. Or curved versus flat. So mm -hmm. I mean, you're dealing with mounting mechanism differences and, and just material differences. And then also when you're picking out where you want the antenna to go, you want to figure out how to avoid obstacles as best you can. You don't want to I'm have... To oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Sorry. Chris is always ahead of the class. Too structured. Um, so I also have to take into consideration the mounting options. Do you have things like a batwing antenna or Right, absolutely. Some other, what are some other things that people might be able to utilize on their RV to mount to? Well, you could be using the uh, vertical post of your uh, rear ladder or front ladder. You could be using even just mounting to the side of another structure on the roof, whether it's an air conditioner or a, a refrigerator vent, if you can get it now up above. So, you know, looking at the space that you have available to you and really trying to plan in advance to understand what what, what options do you have and sort of making sure you've got all the pieces. And, and really coming from the outside of the RV, <laughs> into the inside of the RV, it presents sometimes the largest challenge. Uh, in our case, the factory from Newmar, they come with a conduit from the roof into the electronics department and it made it very easy and in our spoils. video that we just did, it kind yes. of spoils us. And we'll we'll be that. talking a little yeah. bit later about conduit's good. Yes, conduit's good. 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 <laughs> uh, but we'll talk about running cables here in just a moment. Sure. Um, we're actually talking about right now the antenna placement. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
And uh, so bat wings, up, other things running up a, a flagpole or a painter's pole on the side right. of the RV. Right, right. Because so that, that's a, a little bit more work to set up when you get someplace, but you can definitely get some more height that way. It's usually, you're not going to get a whole lot extra from just a few feet of height, but if you're doing a directional antenna or something you really want to get high, uh, planning to put your antenna up a mass that you raise is, is smart. Right. And I was going to say, some of that also depends too. I and mean, we sort of, sort of tend towards the full timer's perspective on things and wanting very permanent installations because we don't want the setup all the time. Right. But if you're not a full time RV, seasonal. seasonal, or you're going to be still for a while. Exactly, yeah. right. So then some of those options with a flagpole or you know those kinds of mounts are definitely a good choice for being less mm -hmm. permanent, less invasive to the RV. And new RVs are less likely to have bat wing antennas since those are not so common anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. And we our RV is 10 years old, so, so we have that available. I think you should explain what a bat wing antenna is. <laughs> right, in the old day, I think they are not, am they, I correct, they're not so common anymore? They're not so common, but they are still made. You can still get them. Right, and a uh, bat wing antenna is basically like rabbit ears on your TV. It, you crank it up, and it rises up and stands about three feet above the roof of the RV and can be rotated around to get on-air signals like the old days, like a set of rabbit ears. And it happens to be handy because it does fall down completely flat on the roof, but it also gains that three feet of height. Yeah. And you demoed one in your Wi-Fi Ranger installation Correct. video. Right. And so enough. that's the type of thing. And that does give you a lot of flexibility for antenna mounting. It, yeah. it really did. Yeah. Again. Especially for the really tall one, because yeah. then the antenna can go flat. That, that's kind of the Wi-Fi Ranger way, is they like to ride along on a bat wing. On the Elite. Yeah, yeah, the Elite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Strictly, this is particularly, of course, anything that's on a bat wing antenna has to be a type of antenna that's strictly for use while you're parked since, since you cannot keep the bat wing antenna up while the RV is moving. Well, you can. It's well, a really bad it idea. It won't stay that way. <laughs> okay. You shouldn't. Thank you. It, it, it may fly off like a bat in the wing. And it yes, is. right. <laughs> Don't keep your bat wing antenna while you're doing it. Bad idea. Right. Bat wing um, fail video. So yes. another consideration in placing your antenna is also what type of antenna that you're installing. Is this a cellular antenna? Yes, is it a Wi-Fi uh, wi antenna? Is it omnidirectional? or uh, a directional antenna um, and also we just covered is it one that needs to be upright and tall or does it kind of go flat like right. the sky is very very low to the roof exactly. from Wi-Fi Ranger right. which is an option for those that don't have a lot of and, and, and the reason you, you height is important is it's gonna be very damaging to have a tree branch suddenly rip your antenna off <laughs> This Just to the antenna thing. and also to your RV roof, right. depending upon how secure of an attachment you have. <laughs> well, no, if you're really good at attaching, you can do some damage. And, and that's a big question that we may get into later, which is depending on the type of RVing that you do, if you're someone who goes from full hookup RV park to full hookup RV park, as opposed to someone who goes into the national forests or national parks, where, where you're approach. going to be having trees potentially scraping across the top of your RV, if you're lucky enough, again, to have a bat wing antenna like we do, where it falls completely flat to the roof when you're underway, that won't get broken, where an antenna that's mounted low on the roof but sticks up even only a foot or two, that could be broken by a limb if you're in the woods. And that's one of the advantages of these magnetic mount uh, cellular antennas is they're designed to be magnet. So if they do get swiped by something, they just fall over, and then they usually write themselves. And you're not having to, if, whereas if you screw something yeah. in, then you can, you're potentially damaging. And, and some other types of antennas have a spring mount so they can yeah. bend down and bounce Like the trucker style antennas that are so popular, which the, are not great for gaming. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, omnidirectional versus um, a directional antenna. A directional antenna, you need a way to aim yeah. that yeah. antenna if sure. you're going to do a permanent mount on yeah. it. So that's why they're very often on poles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, to be able to give you that flexibility of placement and aiming. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the other consideration that's very important for the antennas on the roof is the separation, is mm -hmm. thinking through the separation. Um, for our cellular antenna, this doesn't apply to Wi-Fi, but for a cellular antenna, the inside and outside antennas, you want them as far apart as possible. And so when you're planning... If you're doing a booster system. Yeah, if you're doing, if you're doing, well, yeah, if you're doing a booster, um, you want the, the retransmit antenna in, on the inside far as far apart from the outside because you don't want the outside antenna to hear the inside antenna because that's just like walking with a microphone in front of a speaker and you hear that feedback and that's what's happening inside it's the booster. It's called oscillation and that's what can happen when yeah. it's picking up its own right. signal. And and this, is, this would be something with, your, with uh, cellular, not with Wi-Fi. Exactly. Right? Right. Only with cellular. Only with cellular. And only with a booster involved. Mm -hmm. And when you've got the inside and outside antenna, so it's 
They want to be separated, and actually that's one of the reasons residential boosters tend not to be recommended for RVs, because they need even more separation than the mobile boosters. Mm -hmm. uh, but the more separation you can get, the better. And so when you're planning where you want things on your roof, plan also where you're going to have things on the inside, and think this all through before the you... The distance that you're going to have the between them. Right. And if you don't get enough um, separation going for distance-wise, sometimes putting a sheet of metal, aluminum foil, or something underneath between them somehow, whether it's underneath the exterior antenna, can give some extra shielding to prevent some of that oscillation from happening. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so now you can talk about how you saw the roof. You know, okay. With, okay, other things on the roof, just, you know, you don't want to avoid them. You don't, ideally you don't want your antennas too close to each other, but it's, they don't have to be very far, just a few inches is fine usually. Mm -hmm. And we saw the different signals, so they're all yeah, operating they're all in different, different frequencies. frequencies. Some people, different people have like a ham radio, they have a mm -hmm. Wi-Fi, and they have a TV, maybe a radio, maybe a CV. All these things have different radio waves that they're working at. Yeah, right. Um, and how, you know, different ones will have different interference. And, and also you tend to use them at different times, too. So. Yeah. Well, and we actually also heard some about just other interference as well, not necessarily from the intention of the antenna actually broadcasting, but like the batwing antennas have a power amplifier that actually powers the antenna. Some people have said they've noticed that with the power on to that, mm. they get an interference with their signal, whether it's yeah, Wi-Fi or cellular. So just be aware, and that could even be a factor of aging as the equipment ages, that you could be getting more RF interference just from the power source for the device. So if you're planning to watch TV using your batwing antenna mm -hmm. with the power on at the same time as you're using a Wi-Fi ranger attached to it. And talking on your cellular booster. <laughs> there, there could be some issues with that. Yes. Yes. So basically, you should be single tasking. You should be watching <laughs> and, <laughs> and not surfing the web and yeah. talking to your it, it just, right. it just, In fringe areas, if you have problems, that's just part of your troubleshooting. It's like, huh, I'm having trouble here. Maybe I should try turning off this, the, the TV booster. Which I'm not yeah. using at the time right. anyway. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah, right. um, so other considerations on the roof is if you have solar panels, uh, these antennas can cast a shadow on those solar panels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you want to keep that in mind. Minimize that. Uh, uh, and why, why do solar panels don't like? Even just a little bit of shadow on a solar panel can drastically drop the power output for the entire panel. Mm -hmm. So you don't want, um, you know, antennas are pretty small and narrow, so a lot of light refracts around them, and it's not a big deal for small antennas, but still try to avoid it. But like the corner of a roof vent or something can completely cut out all the power output from the solar panel. The now panel. now that, that does change if you're using polycrystalline versus monocrystalline, correct? A little bit. A little bit. It's, 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 yeah, okay. not a big deal. And you spend a lot of money on that solar, you might as well get a bring out. Yes, right. yeah, exactly. Right. Avoid the shadows. But sometimes you have to consider which is more important, my like internet <laughs> my power. It depends on whether the power's going to run out before I'm dying on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Another consideration is uh, t other tall things on your roof, like an air conditioner. You don't want to put a cellular antenna like right in the shadow, like an omnidirectional antenna, because that can actually block the signal coming yeah, into that antenna. Bit, right, sure. get a little bit more separation and get a better view. Another, another benefit of going high if you have a ladder or a bat wing or something else, and uh, the surface mount antennas sit right flat on the roof. The FM models of Wi-Fi rangers sit right flat on the roof, and so if your air conditioner is eight inches tall and you were to put that antenna mounted to the surface right next to it, the bottom eight inches of that antenna is now being blocked on that side. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, those are all considerations to make on where to place the physical antenna on your roof. So let's say we, we've picked now our ideal places to put our antennas. Right. Great. Great. <laughs> now how do we get those wires that they come with into I, the inside of the arm? Because a lot of well, them come already attached to the device. They don't unscrew. There's no way to you're having to deal with this installed antenna now with this one. With, with a connector on the Well, yeah. actually, actually, before you figure out how to get it inside, you need to decide where in the inside. That's the other piece of the consideration is mm -hmm. know what your tech cabinet is, know what your destination is, and that's sometimes it actually is easier to work backwards from that destination, that tech cabinet, to the roof to find out your ideal spot. On the right, if, you're, if your cabinet where all your technology, all your uh, electronics your equipment antenna. is, it has to be in a certain place, then you have to work from that spot. now. If you have the option, since that's the most important spot inside, you have to have a place for those electronics. Since the roof basically is very large and you probably have many choices, if you can't put the electronics where you, uh, where you want it to, you might have to start searching for alternate options. Maybe you have a, a cabinet in the back or in the bathroom or in the center somewhere. And if that happens to be adjacent to your refrigerator allowing you to use the vent, you may have to be creative about that exact topic. 
So, so uh, first of all, is where can you get your wires into the RV? What are some ideas on things to look for? Because drilling a hole in your, your roof is probably going to be considered it's scary. the last. It's, it's, it's scary. scary, and it should be kind of a last resort. So first, look for options. What are some existing holes that RVs might have that they could be reutilized? Well, again, you know, again, in our case with the Numar, we had the option of the conduit for uh, satellite which is conduit. pre factory installed and ready to go, which was was really great and, and sort of cheating. We admit it for us. But if but, you if you're having an RV built for you. If you ask your manufacturer to have it done, that install, it's not that difficult mm -hmm. to and put in. Install time, putting in conduit is really, really, really smart. Right. And so in our case, if you haven't seen the video, um, Newmar plans it with a little aluminum plate just covering the junction box where those cables come into for the conduit. So if, again, if you work with your manufacturer and plan that, it's just really easy to be able to access that spot and get your cables run through. But you know, that certainly is the... The cheating and, and just in case anybody doesn't know what a conduit is, think of it as just, it, it is a pipe that goes from one place to the other and you could fish or, or pull through a wire from one end to the other without having to go inside the walls and uh, do anything <laughs> else. So having your tech cabinet might be 10 feet away than your, where you come out on the roof, conduit makes that easy. And, and when you're easy. picking the size of the conduit, so you can just go at PVC piping, you mm -hmm. can get, there's flexible ones there's that you can get, there's metal. But consider the width of that conduit that you want to use because you need to take into account that you're also going to be fishing not just the wires, but the ends, which might be a right. big Ethernet port, it could right. be um, other like coax or table coax or right. something like that. Right. What, would you, what would you consider to be the minimum size someone should consider for a conduit? Width? Well, we have conduit that I believe from the factor is approximately two inches, would you say? Maybe, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's tight. It's, Maybe well, it's an, it might be an inch and a half. Yeah. It's, it's longer than we would like. There's no reason that Numar had to make it that way. The electronics cabinet is right over the driver's seat, and our conduit is about four feet or so back from there for no real reason that we are aware of. And it makes it difficult because of that length. It comes through from the roof, takes a little bend, and goes straight ahead, and then takes a little bend down. And it is a challenge. And when we had our satellite dish installed, they had a real hard time, not only because of that length, but because they had, I believe, four wires yeah. to come through, and it makes it very difficult. So the larger the conduit, the better, okay. and the shorter the distance, the better. For I, I would think that for a typical installation, it's particularly these days with SWM on satellite, you need fewer cables coming through, yeah. a power cable. So maybe three quarter of an inch to an inch. It's probably an, 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 inch an inch would work for an Ethernet cable and a. Yeah. And a so if you're doing a, a, so if someone's it. doing something like a Wi-Fi extending antenna, like the Wi-Fi range oh. early and a typical Wilson booster antenna on the top, right. and maybe they need to run something else. Mm -hmm. Three quarter inch to an inch should. And, and if you want a future proof, and you can go an inch and a half or two inches if there's room in the roof structure and they can do that, Correct. the larger the conduit is, easier the to more wires them. you can put in, and the easier they are to feed. Don't go small for no reason. <laughs> if, they, if they say they can fit a, an inch and a half to two inch pipe in there, say yes. <laughs> If they say you can do a two-foot one, say yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have questions. We'll finish up and we'll, we'll do, we will take questions. <laughs> okay. We've been flashed. <laughs> the, the AD is letting us know. Yes. All right. Um, oh, but, but keeping on with that topic. Yeah. So what are, what, are, what are some? So let's so say conduit, frit, frit conduits would be the ideal way. That okay, but let's vent. say that's not an option. Okay. What are what are some that's other? Most popular. Fridge vent. Fridge vent is great because that usually drops down right behind your refrigerator. And you might need to pull your, the very first time, you might need to pull the refrigerator out or something to get some access to do that, but at least it doesn't require putting holes in right. into the roof. Right. Um, that's and beginning to get a little more rare now with all electric coaches and right. residential fridges. Of course, right. those vents are disappearing. So well, also, if somebody's putting in something temporarily, they could use the, out the window. The window. Yeah, the yeah window. if you're just testing your equipment, don't go drilling holes or anything. <laughs> Test it first, put it out the window. Or, <laughs> or, out, or out the seal on the slide. Right, right. Yes. Yes. Right. So some people do wrap their, their wires through their seals on the, the corners, slides. Yeah. Is that a good idea? Well, we, we don't have slides, so we can't. We, have, we don't have experience with that. My, my take on that is that if you're going to use that over a period of time, then there's a very good likelihood that the movement of the slide is going to well, sooner or later cut the cable. But that's for temporary use. Yeah. So it's not when you're, you're leaving it there while you're moving the slide. No, no. We know some people that do. They that's have it routed in, and it's a permanent install going through the slide. If you're going to do that, I'd be extremely careful, be cognizant of what the slide is going to scrape. Yeah. Whether it's going to damage the cable. And plan for the fact that those slides move. So even though when you're positioned when you're doing the install, it may have perfect yes. clearance then, 
you may be in an unlevel campsite and putting that slide sure. in or out, and you could get uh, the Pinch edge of the slide yeah, exactly right. pinching or cutting the cable. Okay. Um, but okay. another option too, just um, I know in our RV, uh, the vent stacks for the tanks go up through the toilet room right to the roof, and there's actually a corner piece in the corner where that vent stack goes up. So it's a little bit more destructive to actually access that, but that is also another alternative for getting a wire into the roof is to actually put it in through where that vent stack comes through the roof. More and side. Have it, right, and more side pull along side that tube. Now, if you actually do have to drill a hole in here, yes. what are your tips on that? Well, the biggest <laughs> problem with drilling, again, we're, we're not RV technicians and we have not done multiple installs of this, but with working with uh, RV components, with working on the roof and seeing the holes that go through there, the single there, people are very afraid of drilling through their roof. For good reason. Yeah. For right. good reason. And you I should like be. mine waterproof. Yeah. We, we've drilled in our roof a number of times. We installed our own solar panels and sort of fearlessly drilled through the roof once we got, we realized it was okay to do. But if you're going to do more than just put a screw into the roof, like for a solar panel bracket, and drilling a hole, the single biggest thing to be concerned about, even before waterproofing, is what's in the roof? Are there electric cables running through? Is there, are there ventilation? ducts running through, and I, I honestly don't know the answer about how to find a spot. You may need to get a wiring, get diagram. A wiring diagram, contact your manufacturer, tell your manufacturer what you're planning to do and get their input. And uh, actually getting up on the roof or having view of the roof uh, when there's dew, when the temperature shifts, actually is an opportunity to be able to see where the girders for the roofing framing structure yeah. are. So when that temperature shift happens, I know we see it on the sidewalls of our RV, right. where you can where see, you the, dew. see the, the dew pattern, and so that can give you an idea of where the bracing structures are, and then typically, obviously, your best bet is to go in between those if you need to get all yes. the way through. Now, of course, if you're in the desert southwest, that's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and be careful walking in a roof while it's wet. Yes, yes, exactly right. Okay. So, right. So, games. okay, so that's some good ideas from running cables. I think yeah. we've, we've uh, covered okay. that pretty well. Uh, so, last thing maybe with about waterproofing afterwards. Oh, okay. yes, yes. 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 Uh, DICOR is your friend. Uh, you've, if you've seen any of our videos, we've used it again and again and again and again, and we get a lot of questions. Well, I have a metal roof uh, because, I, because I have uh, an aluminum trailer and an Airstream, an Airstream, or I have a, a rubber roof, TPO or EPDM. DICOR works on any kind of RV roof that we have any experience with or we know of, and if you get DICOR self-leveling lap sealant and put that around things that go down into the RV, that is the primary waterproofing method. Um, if you're putting something in very permanently that has a little bit bigger gap and you need a little more, you can use Eternabond tape. Just be aware it will never, <laughs> never come off. They're serious about the Eterna. Where, where can people get Dicor and Eternabond? Is that a, typically hardware stores? Or? No, actually, I, uh, I haven't seen it there. Any RV dealer that has a parts department will have tubes of Dicor self-leveling lap sealant. And it comes, it's typically white, but it comes in Dove. Uh, we all have, all of us who have any links to anything for sale on Amazon, it's ubiquitous. Just remember DICOR, D-I-C-O-R, self-leveling lap sealant. Okay. And if you are an RVer and you don't know what DICOR is, start learning about that because it needs to be checked routinely anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, so when we're uh, mounting our antennas, that DICOR can be part of that? As far as the, uh, probably, right. probably with the antenna routing and securing the antennas on the roof, because you just don't want to leave those antennas loose yeah. up well, there on the roof. <laughs> did we want to touch on that quickly? We have time for that. Yeah, yeah. How to attach them to the roof? Yeah. yeah. And I was going to say, I mean, starting also with like the cellular issue of the grounding plane, right? right. Yeah, may so mean that you're going to be able to take advantage of the magnetic mount for the antenna right. itself. So, so magnetic mount antennas are really great things to use, but they need to be on a metal surface. You can't just glue them to a fiberglass roof. They won't work properly. They need to have a metal underneath them, um, maybe an eight inch diameter plate. It could be any kind of metal. Your cookie sheet, cookie mm -hmm. sheets work, or you can just get some uh, old saw blade. Old saw blade. Mm -hmm. And you could actually use an adhesive to um, attach this to your roof someplace, and then someplace near where your wires come out, and then just have the magnet Grip, grip onto that, and so you can attach those. But you're still going to have a wire from there going into right. wherever your hole is, Correct. and yes. the way that it, you don't want that wire just up there because it, it could get snagged by trees or things like that. Right. Um, so, in the wind. so you know, the easiest one is you can just do little dots of die bore and just kind mm -hmm. of puddle it in there, and right. then I'll keep it at least down on the roof. Yeah. Uh, running it through conduit is another. Yeah, on the roof. Right. Right. We demonstrated in our video, we demonstrated using the Turnabond tape because we made the conscious decision to make a very permanent installation and we did mention 
make sure you know that this is a permanent installation. It will not come up. And the only way we would get that off our roof is to carefully slice the Eternabon and pull the wire out, and the, but the Eternabon will not come off the roof. We'd suggest that what Cherie just mentioned, which is a piece of mm -hmm. conduit with the cable inside it and then glue that down. Right. Yeah, or just puddles of vicor, right? Yep. Any other tips or recommendations on screws, anchors, things like that? Should they be a certain type of metal to avoid? We definitely try to go for a, a galvanized or a stainless, stainless if you can. Just because we don't want to have to deal with longer term there being issues of rust or corrosion on the metal screws themselves. But again, typically we're pretty liberal with the die core and cover just about <laughs> everything. So we, we overuse die core a little bit, but <laughs> so your your RV is made of die core. Yes, yes. Uh, you can screen. you can never use too much die core. <laughs> you, you can see how excited they get about die core. <laughs> <laughs> die core is the greatest stuff ever. All right, so that, that pretty much wraps up the content that we oh, great. we talked sure. about. So I, I'm assuming Stephen's got some questions for us. If you do have questions, we welcome them. Go ahead and type we're them. We're here in. for you guys. Go ahead and type them into the chat box.